common sense compromise to keep this federal government moving forward and to make sure our economy is focused upon and that we, we produce as many jobs as possible. That is job one. Mr. President, I thank you for your attention, for your commitment, for your interest. Uh, I yield the floor. And I would note the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka. We're going to have more on funding for the federal government in a minute. A first, an update from the Associated Press. Uh, president Obama met with the Colombian president in the Oval Office today about a newly finalized free trade agreement with the country. The Obama administration announced the deal yesterday after the Colombian government agreed to take additional steps to protect worker rights. The administration says the agreement will boost U.S. exports to Colombia by $1 billion a year. Senator Reid and House Speaker Boehner are to meet with President again at the White House in a couple of hours. That's at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. They'll try to reach agreement on federal spending uh, to prevent a federal government shutdown. Uh, here's more debate from the Senate floor today about spending for the rest of this budget year. And at this point is to promote uh, a social agenda that is not acceptable to the broader part of the country. They're willing to shut down the federal government, put our economy, our small businesses, our veterans at risk, and potentially delay tax refunds for millions of American families, all simply to make a political point and to try to impose a social agenda of a minority on the majority. Shutting down the federal government over, over a woman's right to choose or the federal government's ability to enforce laws that protect our children's health, in my view, takes irresponsibility to a whole new level. Even the Speaker of the House himself has said a shutdown will, quote, end up costing more than we save. And the Speaker's right. 
it would cost about eight billion dollars every week or two point two percent of GDP every week the government is shut down now the speaker's right on the substance but he has not yet been willing to lead and deal with the tempest in the Tea Party on his right threatening to cut our economic recovery short to satisfy a narrow right-wing political agenda at a time when small businesses are just beginning to get access to capital they need to create jobs for American families a shutdown will result in four hundred million dollars in capital each week not going to small businesses through the SBA loan program and will throw the engine of small business job growth into neutral when we want it to be in overdrive in the last shutdown more than a million dollars in small business loans to 5200 businesses were delayed so we know what small businesses are in for if we have another shutdown Mr. President this is not the time in our recovery efforts to say no to helping small businesses put people to work in housing the FHA loan process which accounts for 30 percent of the housing market will be interrupted just as we enter the height of the spring season home buying in my state of New Jersey with prices low and so many houses on the market this is not the time to prevent 15,000 homeowners from getting a home loan every week more than half of which are for new home purchases that would reduce the inventory of the surplus properties now unfortunately because Social Security is a mandatory fund fortunately I should say because Social Security is a mandatory funding program seniors and the disabled will continue to receive their checks but if we let the tempest in the Tea Party shut down the government interruptions at the Social Security Administration could delay changes in people's benefits and payments in just four days of the last shutdown 112,000 new claims for Social Security retirement and disability benefits were not taken over 800,000 callers were unable to reach the Social Security Administration and certainly in this economy this is not a time to leave those who rely on Social Security with nothing and with the tax season upon us it's certainly not the right time to delay tax refunds that families are anxiously awaiting in order to make ends meet and put into the economy and help the recovery keep going it's not the time to shut down 368 National Park Service sites the Smithsonian the Statue of Liberty the monuments museums national parks across the country which in the last shutdown lost nine million visitors and the tourism revenues to those communities and given that our last shutdown occurred in the dead of winter we can expect a shutdown in the midst of spring breaks and high tourist season to have a much larger impact on tourism revenues and family wallets who have already booked trips to national parks and planned visits to national monuments and museums and to put it in context if we shut down the government for five weeks we could lose up to 1.2 billion dollars based on the 12 billion dollars worth of visitors brought to the national park communities last year and if the Tea Party continues to insist on a government shutdown military paychecks would be delayed at a time when military families are struggling with multiple deployments and struggling like everyone else to make ends meet they'll ultimately get paid but only when the shutdown is finished in the last shutdown more than four hundred thousand veterans saw their disability checks delayed now let's not repeat that mistake when more of our wounded sons and daughters are returning home from two wars raging abroad every day and if the Tea Party continues to insist on a government shutdown clinical trials of life-saving drugs will be halted new patients will not be accepted into clinical research programs at the National Institutes of Health if the Tea Party continues to insist on a government shutdown they'll put our entire economy at risk as a matter of fact business leaders 
has said that a shutdown could result in higher interest rates and chaos in the markets. Every week, 350 import licenses could be delayed, resulting in holding up billions of dollars in American exports at a time when we need those exports to help fuel the recovery. During the 1995 shutdown, $2.2 billion in U.S. exports couldn't leave the country because a thousand export licenses could not be issued. Ivan Seidenberg, the chairman and CEO of Verizon, who is also the chairman of the Business Roundtable, said, and I quote, I don't think any of the CEOs would welcome a government shutdown. Problems for business would run from contracts being postponed to disruptions in the supply chain. John Engler, the president of the Business Roundtable, said, quote, business would face the danger of the law of unintended consequences. Interest rates could rise and there could be turmoil in the financial markets. Now, this would all happen because Republicans being held hostage by Tea Partiers have rejected $33 billion in spending cuts for this year because they did not get all that they wanted, because they aren't getting their way on unrelated extraneous social issues like women's reproductive rights and enforcing laws on our books to protect our children's health. They simply will not take yes for an answer because yes on spending cuts isn't really their only goal. Spending cuts is not why they are trying to shut the government down. I would remind our colleagues that democratic governments are not about total victory. Authoritarian, authoritarian governments do that, not democracies. In democracies, we are all fairly elected to represent our constituents. We all have a view. We all have a vote. We all have an obligation to govern and legislate for every American, not just for those who hold the views of the Tea Party. With all due respect, Mr. President, Tea Partiers claim to love our right to free speech and yet clearly don't believe anyone's views other than their own are acceptable. I would say to our colleagues, we all have deeply held beliefs. Defending them and shouting them from the rooftops is easy, but listening to those who disagree with us and working on the differences is the hard work of government. I would remind my colleagues on the other side that the word Congress is derived from a Latin verb meaning to walk together. We have already made cuts to the President's budget. We have already, already made real cuts in this year's spending. We've offered reasonable compromise that seeks even more cuts, but more importantly a compromise that seeks common ground, not capitulation and neither should our colleagues expect capitulation. All we ask is that those on the other side do what's right and act in the broader interests of the nation, not shut down the government, disrupt services, put the economic recovery at risk, all to satisfy a narrow political agenda. Now, I know there was a lot of fanfare on the Republican budget proposal that was put out as we look to the next fiscal year. In my view, it is by far one of the most partisan, ideological, and fundamentally destructive budgets I have seen in my time in Congress. Destructive of fundamental protections for every American and for what we've come to accept as fundamental protections that are uniquely American. It fundamentally takes $1.5 trillion out of health care for seniors and children, and it gives it to the wealthy. It would take health care from seniors and children rather than take subsidies from special corporate interests like big oil companies. If Republicans got their way, New Jersey residents would lose $34 billion in health benefits, and almost 400,000 New, New Jerseyans would see their coverage cut entirely. The Republican proposal talks about cutting taxes, but in reading it, I find only two groups whose taxes would be cut, the rich and those who are even richer. Corporations and millionaires, or those soon to be millionaires, will keep all of their recent tax giveaways and would actually see their tax rates slashed by 30%. Now, this proposal loses 700 
$100 billion on the revenue side over the next 10 years by extending the Bush tax cuts, particularly to the wealthiest in the country, and trillions more by slashing tax rates for corporations and millionaires. Those making more than a million a year will see tax cuts of $125,000 each from the tax cuts and tens of thousands of dollars more from proposed rate cuts, while people in my state would lose $34 billion. Objection. Mr. President, I, I take this time because we're now only literally hours away from a potential shutdown of government. I must tell you, I, I, my constituents are angry about this. And I join them in saying that this should never happen. There's no reason why we should have a government shutdown. We know the financial issues, and there's been good faith negotiations. And it's my understanding that we have pretty much resolved the, the financial issues. And remember, we're dealing with 12 percent of the federal budget. We need to get on to the 2012 budget. We need to get a credible plan to deal with the deficit. We all understand that. We're talking about the 2011 budget, the budget that started on October 1 of last year and will end on September 30th of this year. We're over halfway through that, that budget year. And the differences between where the Democrats were and where the Republicans were understood that couldn't be what the Democrats wanted or the Republicans wanted. We need to have a good faith negotiations. Those negotiations have taken place. It's my understanding we pretty much have agreed on the dollar amounts and we're prepared to move forward on that. But let me just talk a little bit about what will happen at midnight tomorrow night. I had the honor of representing the people of the, of the state of Maryland. Mr. President, there's almost 150,000 civilian, civilian active federal employees that live in the state of Maryland. I happened to bump into one of those federal employees today who asked me a question. She asked me, what am I supposed to do if we have a government shutdown and I don't get a paycheck? I don't have savings. How am I going to pay for my mortgage? We already have too many people whose mortgages are in jeopardy because of the weakness of our economy. And now 150,000 Marylanders are in jeopardy of losing their paycheck as a result of the inability to resolve this year's budget. Now, I must tell you, I also happened to talk to the people who run our metro system here, and they told me that if we have a government shutdown, it will mean a million dollars less in fare box policy every day because of the number of people who won't be taking the metro because they're not going to be going to work. A lot of federal workers. They're not going to be going to work. And guess what? They're not going to be stopping at that coffee shop to buy coffee. They're not going to be buying that lunch. They won't be patronizing the shops. And it's going to hurt the small business owners who, who depend upon that business, depend upon the, 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 the people who use their paychecks to, 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 do, their, to do their cleaning or do their, go to their, the, the, the different shops. It's going to hurt. It's going to hurt our economy. It's going to hurt innocent small business owners just at a time that our economy is starting to recover. Now, we know, I could, I could give you another example. A person contacted me today, one of my constituents in Maryland, who happens to have an issue concerning the need for a passport to be issued. It needs to be issued rather quickly. And we're going to try to accommodate that person and get it done by tomorrow. But suppose that call would have come in next week after there's a government shutdown, and that person has travel plans that now may be disrupted because we can't issue that passport. And the list goes on and on and on of people who are going to be hurt as a result of a government shutdown. We know that a government shutdown will actually cost the taxpayers more money. A shutdown costs taxpayers money. More money than the differences in our negotiations in the last couple of days will be lost. So don't tell the taxpayers of this country that we're having a government shutdown to save money. It won't save taxpayer money. It will cost them additional monies. It will jeopardize our recovery. And individual people are going to get hurt as a result of the government shutdown. 
So, Mr. President, what's the issue here? We've already said that the money, the money issues, this is a budget debate, we pretty well, well resolved the money issues. So it's not the dollars, not the differences you've heard, and the differences, quite frankly, were rather small compared to the size of our national, uh, of our budget deficit and the, and, and, and the gap between spending and, and, and revenues. The issue that is now being raised by the Republicans has nothing to do with dollars, but it has to do with their social policies. Their social policies. It has to do with family planning. It has to do with the Environmental Protection Agency being able to enforce our environmental laws, the Clean Air Act. Does that sound familiar? It should, because we debated those issues on the floor of the Senate yesterday. And we took votes on these environmental issues yesterday on the floor of the Senate as we should do on debating these issues on their own individual merit. It shouldn't be included in the budget resolution for the remainder of this year. That's not the appropriate place for it. We're not here to debate the, the social agenda. Those issues should be done on the bills, the substantive bills that come forward. So, you sort of get a little suspicious here as these issues are being raised as to whether, in fact, those who are negotiating on the Republican side are sincere in trying to reach an agreement to prevent a government shutdown, or whether they continuously change the goalposts and, and the rules in order to bring about a government shutdown. Now, I must tell you, I was really disappointed as I heard Republican after Republican in the last couple weeks talk about, well, you know, a shutdown might be good for the, for the country. Say, you know, if we have a shutdown, so be it. Let's do it. Even some Republicans calling for a shutdown. I understand there's a problem that the Speaker of the House has in, in dealing with the, the members of the Republican caucus who belong to the Tea Party and they're insisting that he don't he doesn't want to see any compromise. I understand that, but it, those members don't control the process. We have a majority of the members of the House, a majority of members of the Senate that are prepared to move forward with this compromise that will not only keep government functioning, but will allow us to get on to the real issues of, of dealing with the deficit of this country by looking at the 2012 budget, where we will be considering more than just the discretionary domestic spending cuts, where we also could take a look at the other programs, including military and mandatory spending and revenues, and get a credible plan to deal with the deficit. We have enough votes among the Democrats and Republicans to, to pass this compromise. We don't have to yield to the extremists on the Republican side in the House that don't want to see any compromise whatsoever. But what really worries me is that perhaps the design here is really to close the government. That's what the Republicans want. I know that Speaker Boehner got a standing ovation when he informed his caucus to begin preparing for a possible shutdown. So, Mr. President, these are serious issues. Like that Marylander who I talked to today who may in fact lose her home if there's a government shutdown. Or that constituent who had planned a trip and found out that because their passport will expire shortly, they need to get it renewed before they're permitted to enter a foreign country and will need to get that passport tended to or lose the opportunity to travel, perhaps for a family event or perhaps for business or the taxpayers of this country who are scratching their heads saying, what are you doing adding to the cost of government? When I thought this was a debate about reducing the cost of government. It's not about the dollars. If we have a, a shutdown of government, and I really hope we don't have a shutdown of government, but if we have a shutdown of government, it's not the dollar difference. It's the social agenda that the Republicans are trying to push through this document that shouldn't even be on this document that they're now using as a reason 
to deny a compromise from moving forward, and it's the extreme elements within the Republican caucus that are saying, let's have a government shutdown that would be getting their way. Mr. President, there's still time remaining. I hope that's, that common sense will prevail. I hope people understand how serious a government shutdown is to our country, to our image internationally, to our ability to conduct international business, as well as to provide the services to the people of this nation who expect those services. We still have time. This is a democracy. Let's the majority rule. And I really do think we have the majority of Democrats and Republicans alike that want to bring this issue to conclusion, know that we have a good compromise done right now that compromises the differences between what the Democrats would want and what the Republicans would want. That's how the process should work. So, yes, I'm here representing the people of Maryland including a large number that work for the federal government and a large number that depend upon those who work for the federal government and a large number who depend upon the services of the federal government to say, let's get this done, not yield to the few on the Republican side in the House. Let's get this job done for the people of Maryland and for the people of this nation. And with that, Mr. President, I would yield the floor and notice uh, an absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka. Mr. President. Senator from South Dakota. Mr. President, are, are we in a quorum call? Yes, we are. I would ask unanimous consent the quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection. Mr. President, uh, tomorrow night at midnight, uh, unless steps are taken, we will be facing a government shutdown. And when I say steps are taken, that steps are taken to avoid that. And that can happen one of two ways. Uh, that could be an agreement that uh, funds the government through the end of the fiscal year, which would be September 30th of this year. Um, and there are negotiations that continue on dealing with that issue. Or uh, there could be a short-term continuing resolution that would take us uh, through the next week that uh, would enable those who are negotiating a longer-term agreement to continue uh, that, their discussions and hopefully to conclude a successful outcome to those discussions. But I want to remind my colleagues, and I, and I say this, and I, I feel sometimes I've been up here on the floor a number of times uh, speaking to this issue, but I think it bears repeating. Why we are here, why we are now in the middle of yet a sixth continuing resolution. This is the sixth short-term funding resolution that we have had to live with, uh, you know, since the end of the fiscal year, which was September 30th of last year. 
So the reason we are here is because last year the Democrat majority here in Congress failed to pass a budget and failed to pass a single appropriation bill. Uh, didn't do the most fundamental responsibility that we have to the American taxpayers, and that is to put together a budget that funds their government. And so we have funded the government through these successive continuing resolutions, which, as I said before, we are now in the middle of the sixth short-term funding resolution, which expires tomorrow night at midnight. And so my colleagues on the other side have been coming to the floor and attacking the Republicans for wanting to shut the government down. And I would say to my colleagues, uh, Mr. President, that nothing could be further from the truth. I think everybody here recognizes that no one benefits from a government shutdown. Uh, frankly, uh, the, uh, the effort has been made in the House of Representatives to pass a long-term funding resolution that would take us through the end of the fiscal year, through September 30th of this year, uh, but that failed here in the Senate. We had a vote on that. It failed. Um, and there hasn't been since that time any meaningful effort made on the part of the Democrats here in the Senate to put forward a proposal that might in fact be able to pass the Senate and ultimately pass in the House of Representatives. And so we've triggered these discussions between the White House, between the uh, leadership in the House of Representatives and the, the leader of the Democrats here in the United States Senate. My understanding is those discussions continue. Uh, I hope that they will reach a conclusion, a successful conclusion. But until that time happens, uh, we need to do something to make sure that the government stays open uh, beyond tomorrow night at midnight. And so we will receive from the House of Representatives a piece of legislation that they passed earlier today, a continuing resolution, uh, that actually reduces government spending by about $13 billion, discretionary spending, all cuts that have been agreed to by both parties, and also uh, extends funding for the military through the end of the fiscal year. There's been a lot of discussion about we need to provide some certainty for our military so that they can plan, and I absolutely agree with that. I've met with members of our military, with our leadership, military leadership. It is really important, Mr. President, that we take care of the funding needs that they have through the end of this fiscal year. And so what do the House of Representatives do? They, they took a, uh, a series of spending reductions, which had been agreed upon, as I said, by both parties. They funded the military through the end of the fiscal year, through September 30th, and they added a couple of provisions to that legislation that had been widely supported by both parties here in the Congress. There is a, a ban on abortion funding in the District of Columbia, which has been supported by the, the Democrat leader, the Democrat whip on countless occasions. They included a provision that would prevent funding being used to bring detainees and try them here in the United States instead of at Guantanamo Bay. That is something that has been widely supported. In fact, the last time it was supported was when the defense authorization passed it late last year in December, passed by unanimous consent. So many of my Democrat colleagues are on record supporting all the things, all the elements that are in this continuing resolution that was sent to us earlier, will be coming over to us from the House of Representatives. And so the question then becomes, who is it that is trying to trigger a government shutdown? Now, I'm not here this evening to, to play the blame game. I don't think that serves anybody's interest, nor do I believe that a government shutdown serves anybody's interest very well. I think that the, the American people expect us to find solutions. They expect us to work out our differences, but eventually to agree. And I think that, that that has certainly happened in the form of this continuing resolution that can, that's coming over from the House of Representatives. And in fact, it passed the House today with 247 votes, including a number of Democrats. There were a number of Democrats who voted with majority Republicans in the House to pass a continuing resolution that takes on the issue of out-of-control Washington spending, which has been very clearly documented. We need to get spending under control. We are adding to the federal debt at a rate of $4 billion every single day, which means by tomorrow night at 6.30, at 6.30 tonight, tomorrow night, 6.30 on Friday, we will have added another $4 billion to the debt. That's the, that's the debt meter that we're running. Every single day, we add $4 billion to the federal debt that we pass on to future generations. We are borrowing over 40 cents out of every single dollar that the federal government spends. We cannot continue to do that, Mr. President. We'll take in $2.2 trillion this year, spend $3.7 trillion. That's $1.5 trillion in deficits in a single year. 
You add that up year after year after year, and you end up with a $14 trillion debt, which is where we are today, and it's growing at a trillion and a trillion and a, at a trillion and a half every single year. And so we've got to get spending under control. Now, I understand there isn't a lot of appetite on the other side of the aisle for taking on federal spending. In fact, uh, many of my uh, colleagues on the other side uh, thought it was an ambitious proposal when they put forward an alternative to the Republican-passed pa bill that cut discretionary spending by $61 billion. They put forward an alternative that cut $4.7 billion. That's the equivalent of what the federal debt we will add in the next 24 hours. That's, that was their, uh, I guess, um, idea about a serious effort to meaningfully address deficit spending and debts. The fact of the matter is, Mr. President, we have got to deal with the issue of out-of-control spending. Now, clearly, the continuing resolution, the short-term continuing resolution that passed the House, is coming to the Senate, uh, takes on that issue, but does it in a way that cuts spending, spending cuts that, as I said, both sides have agreed to. It, it is a mystery to me as to why our colleagues on the other side would reject a proposal that includes spending cuts that have been agreed upon both sides. And frankly, if in fact it's true, the reports that I've read, that Democrats would accept somewhere on the order of $33 billion in cuts for the balance of the fiscal year, this represents about 12 or $13 billion. So we're still considerably under what they have agreed to in terms of a total number. But with regard to the actual cuts that are, that are uh, suggested here by the House passed legislation, they're by and large cuts that the Democrats have agreed with. And so you have agreement on these reductions in spending. You have a general agreement that we ought to fund the troops through the end of the year. And you have an agreement on the so-called riders, at least there has been agreement in the past, broad bipartisan support. And I would argue that the two particular provisions on this bill are provisions that are supported by probably 70% of people across this country. And so you have a, a, a piece of legislation that has broad bipartisan support that's come over to us from the House of Representatives and that would prevent a government shutdown at midnight tomorrow night. And so it's a great uh, mystery as to why uh, our Democrat colleagues would not accept that and, uh, and do what I think is in the best interest of the American people, and that is at least uh, get us into next week where a final negotiation on the uh, longer-term continuing resolution can be concluded. We've got a problem in this country, Mr. President. We've got a government that is spending way beyond its means. We have got to start living within our means. We cannot continue to spend money that we do not have. And the efforts that are being made to reduce spending here are long overdue. And I think that uh, I hope that they can conclude a successful agreement on a longer-term resolution that would get us through the end of this fiscal year. But I think it's important to point out right here, right now, that we have an opportunity to prevent a government shutdown, to fund our troops through the end of the fiscal year, and to reduce in a meaningful way spending with spending cuts that have been agreed to by both sides in the form of this continuing resolution that was passed in the House this afternoon with a large number, not a large number, but a significant number of Democrats supporting it. And so I would suggest to my colleagues on the other side, and I hope that they will uh, work with us to make sure that we avoid a government shutdown, that we fund our troops, and that we make a meaningful debt in out-of-control Washington spending. And so, Mr. President, I would, uh, again, is, as we approach that time tomorrow night at midnight, uh, hope that uh, the leadership on the other side will take up that legislation that was passed by the House of Representatives, give us an opportunity to vote on it. I would submit that there will be a large bipartisan vote here in the United States Senate. If we don't have a large bipartisan vote, it will suggest that there are a lot of people who have changed their positions on the issues that are included uh, in this piece of legislation, because they're all things that many of us on both sides have supported, and I suspect continue to support. That will avoid that witching hour tomorrow night at midnight where the government shuts down. Uh, they've given us an opportunity to vote on legislation that would do that, and I hope we will, we will take them up on that. Mr. President, I yield the floor. Senator from Missouri. Mr. President, um, I uh, think there are times around here that we lose sight uh, 
about what real people are, are doing uh, in our home states. I think we lose sight of the struggles, their daily struggles, uh, how they live their life with integrity and honor every day and go to work. And yesterday, uh, we got a call in my office from a young lady, and she was on her cell phone. She's a nurse, a nurse's aide at the VA hospital in St. Louis. She was on her break, and she was on her cell phone, and she talked to the young lady who answers our phone and said, I, I want you to tell the senator uh, that I've got kids, and I bring home the paycheck, and the way I feed my kids is with my paycheck I get working here at the VA hospital. And I'm scared. I'm scared about what's going to happen if all of a sudden I quit getting my paycheck. I've got really no place to turn. I'm a single mom, and I um, am very worried. And then she said, would you hold on a minute? And then she handed her cell phone to someone else in the break room at John Cochran VA Hospital. And then that woman handed the cell phone to another woman. And by the time this conversation was over, the young lady that answers the phone in my office had talked to a half a dozen women who don't make a lot of money, who go to work every day caring for our veterans in a veterans hospital, and you know what they all said? Why is this happening? Why is this happening? And if LaTanya and her friends were here right now, I would say, you know, that's a darn good question, why this is happening. This is not a game. This is not a game of, of ping pong where we're hitting the ball up and down this hall from the House to the Senate fighting over divisive social issues that, frankly, our country has struggled with, with dec for decades and will continue to struggle with. This is about running our government and about the money it takes to run our government, and that's all it should be about. It shouldn't be a time for us to argue about Gitmo, or it shouldn't be a time for us to argue about women's reproductive health. It should be about funding our government. We have many other occasions we can debate those issues and disagree, and reasonable people do disagree. But now is not the time to debate those issues at the 11th hour when LaTanya is not going to get a paycheck to feed her kids. I'm for cuts. I have been the odd man out many times in my caucus fighting for cuts. I worked on spending cuts last year for, with, with, with Senator Session from Alabama. I continue to work with Senator Corker about cuts. I'm somebody who said the original proposals that my caucus made were way too little. But you know what I'm beginning to feel like? I'm beginning to feel like I've been duped, Mr. President, because I thought that's what this was about. I thought it was about cuts. Now let's review the facts here. The chairman of the House Republican Budget Committee and the Speaker of the Republican House said we need to cut $32 billion out of the remaining budget this year. I've got to tell you the truth. I didn't think that was unreasonable. Now, I'm, you know, I will admit I'm to the right of much of my caucus on some of this, cu this, this cutting stuff, but I didn't think that was unreasonable. So I was glad when we went to the Republicans and said, you know what, we'll cut. We'll cut what you wanted to cut. In fact, we'll cut more than what the House Speaker and the Chairman of the House Budget Committee wanted to cut. And that's where we are today. We have put more cuts in the table than they initially recommended. I'm beginning to realize this isn't about cuts. This is about a much more extreme agenda that has to do with social policy, not about money. They keep moving the goalpost. What is the number? They keep moving the goalpost. We have gone more than halfway, and in my neck of the woods, that's called a compromise. We have the Republicans controlling the House, the Democrats control the Senate. That's why compromise is so important. 
What is wrong with a compromise? Let's do the compromise, fund the government, and get on with it so LaTanya can get her paycheck. And the other women that work with her at the VA hospital can get their paycheck. They will not take yes for an answer on cuts at this point. They want to make it about something else. Was the CR today just about military pay? No, no, it was not. I did notice one thing they didn't put in the CR today. Why won't the House Republicans pass the bill that we've asked them to pass that cut our pay if the government shuts down? I will certainly not take a paycheck, and no one should take a paycheck. Why is that not being passed by the Republican House of Representatives? Why wasn't that put on the CR today? They want to once again pass something about moving people out of Gitmo, which has nothing to do with the budget through the rest of the year. When they were doing the Gitmo thing, why didn't they put the pay for members in there? Why didn't that occur? And I know the talking point is that uh, this is one of the talking points we're hearing from the other side. Well, you know, you should have gotten this done last year. Well, we could get it done today. We could get it done today. We've gone more than halfway on a compromise, and this is no longer about the cuts. This isn't about the money. This is about an extreme agenda. And Latanya's paycheck hangs in the balance, and her friends in the break room at the VA hospital. Let's review what happened last year on the budget. The Republican Party participated in every appropriations committee in the Senate, and every appropriations committee passed a bill. And at the end of the year, that bill was brought to the floor because the appropriators believed that the Republican appropriators were supporting the bills they helped write. In fact, those Republican appropriators stuffed that bill full of earmarks for Republicans. Hundreds of earmarks for Republicans were stuffed in that bill, and it was brought to the floor, and I remember the night it was brought to the floor. It was in the lame duck. And then the Republicans decided they didn't want to support it anymore. And by the way, it wasn't as if passing anything around here was easy last year. Uh, if anybody was paying attention, it was about, let's drag this out, let's be stubborn, let's make sure they've got to get to 60 on everything. And is there blame to go around that the budget didn't get done last year? Sure. There's blame that can go on both sides of this aisle. And I am not here to say that it was the Republicans' fault or the Democrats' fault, but there certainly, it is really, really takes a lot of nerve to say the only reason we don't have a budget is because the Democrats were not willing to pass a budget last year. Uh, it was a little more complicated than that if people were, remember the facts as they occurred at the time. So, it appears to me now that there are certainly a lot of people down the hall that want the shutdown. I was really interested when I saw in the paper that when Speaker Boehner announced to his caucus they were preparing for a shutdown, he got a standing ovation. Well, I can assure you, there are no standing ovations in our caucus. There are no standing ovations. And I'll tell you what, when I go to sleep tonight, I'm going to be thinking about LaTanya. I'm going to be thinking about her kids and what she's telling them tonight and what not, make, not getting one paycheck means to that family. Just one paycheck can make the difference, can send a family down a path of getting behind on their mortgage, getting behind on their bills, and then not having a way to catch up. And that's what we should be thinking about right now. Not about those social issues that we disagree on and that we can debate and disagree on for many, many years as we have for the last 40 in this country, but really, can we get a number? Can we make the goalposts quit moving? Can we agree on the cuts? And then get on to the hard work. I mean, how embarrassing is it that we are fighting over literally a few billion dollars in differences and if this is so much about cutting the debt, uh, for another day, I want to talk about this. But really, the Republican budget was released this week, and guess what it adds to the deficit over the next decade? The Ryan Roadmap, $8.2 trillion it adds to the deficit over the next decade. That's how serious they're getting about the deficit. Cut taxes for a lot of wealthy people doesn't do much on the deficit. 
So I'm all for cuts. I've stood for cuts. I will continue to stand for cuts. This federal government has to shrink. But what's going on right now is a political game, and it's shameful, and it should stop. And we should make an agreement on the numbers, move on, and make sure LaTanya gets paid. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Wyoming. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I come to the floor today as someone who lives in a state, Wyoming, where we balance our budget every year, where the citizens of our great state, families all across Wyoming, live within their means, balance their budgets, know what it means to have to live within a budget. That's why our state, Wyoming, is one that currently today does not have a deficit, does not have a debt, a state where every year, by constitutional mandate, we balance our budget. It's time for Washington to take a lesson from Wyoming and balance its budget. This irresponsible spending must stop. Here we are a day from when it looks like we may be dealing with a government shutdown, and uh, I'm ready to vote. I'm ready to vote for a bill that already passed the House of Representatives early today. I'm ready to vote to keep the government open, to keep the government functioning to make sure services are there. The bill's passed the House. You know, people who studied civics in school realize that that's how we make a law in this country. Pass the House, pass the Senate, goes to the President, signs it into law. The bill's already passed the House, come into the Senate, I'm ready to vote. I don't know where the other senators are, I'm ready to vote. Now, I just heard my colleague from the other side of the aisle talk about a shutdown and who is rooting for a shutdown. I think it's no surprise to people who may be watching at home that it is former Democratic National Committee Chairman Howard Dean who was rooting for a shutdown. The former chairman, the Democratic National Committee, says, quote, I think it would be the best thing in the world to have a shutdown. He's the spokesman for the party of the, op of the other side of the aisle. Well, that may be what he wants. I don't want to do that. I want to vote for the bill that passed the House. It's the only proposal that's out there. I haven't seen the Democrats offer anything. Even the New York Times said of the President, they said he was silent for too long. We've heard our previous speaker talk about uh, the social issues. Well, let's, let's remember that it is a convenient amnesia for the Democrats to talk about that specific issue because the President, President Obama voted for and signed into law spending bills that included similar, the exact same identical social issue in the past, the one that he is opposing today. So did 49 current Senate Democrats voted for a spending bill that dealt with that social issue. So why all of a sudden today it's different? Well, I believe it has to do with what the former chairman of the Democratic National Committee said is that Hey, I think it would be the best thing, he said, in the world, former Go Governor Dean said, to have a shutdown. Republicans are proposing solutions, and what do we see from the, the other side of the aisle? We see one of the senators, the senior senator from New York, saying, I always use the word extreme. Seems it doesn't matter what's proposed. He says, quote, I always use the word extreme. There are tape recordings of him saying this. He then said, this is what, or that is what the caucus instructed me to use this week. Regardless of how reasonable a proposal may be, regardless of the solutions that may be proposed, quote, I always use the word extreme. That is what the caucus instructed me to use this week. Mr. President, I travel back and forth to Wyoming every weekend, visit with people and sit around and uh, different locations. Sometimes it's a morning breakfast group. Sometimes it's people at lunch, dinner, co co uh, community meetings. And I ask them, how many of you believe you have a life that's better than your parents had? And Mr. President, every hand goes up. And then I say, and how many of you believe that your children will have a better life than you have right now? And very few hands go up. That's the problem, Mr. President. I ask them, what is the concern? Why do you believe that you have a better life than your parents did, but your children will not have as good a life as you do? 
And the answer they give is the debt. The reckless spending through Washington, reckless, irresponsible, unsustainable, and yet when we want to go ahead today, do cuts in spending, keep the military going, deal with the issue at hand, keep the government functioning so we can come back and continue to work on the debt and the spending. This body is not ready to vote. I'm ready to vote. I'm ready to vote for the only proposal that's on the table, the one that the Republican and the House of Representatives passed today. That's real leadership. It is a plan and it will work. It's what the American people are asking for. Now I have people from Wyoming all of the time who come to Washington and they will say, you know, we realize that things are tough this year. They come and explain a program that is good for people in the community, good for children, good for seniors. Met with six or seven groups like that today. Good for students in school. And they say, we know that all of us are going to have to deal with the realities of the facts that we can't continue with this unsustainable spending. We're 40 cents out of every dollar we spend is borrowed. Significant amounts from overseas. Our number one, number one lender being from the folks in China. You say, is that your concern? That is absolutely the concern that I hear around the state of Wyoming. They see what the president of China comes over and tells uh, those in America a few weeks ago that he wants the Chinese currency to be the currency of the future and the dollar to be the currency of the past. That's because he knows we have an addiction to spending and it must stop. That's what I hear from people from Wyoming who come here as well. They say we need to make sure that we get the spending under control. It seems reasonable to get back to the levels of 2008 spending, Mr. President. You know, that's the, uh, I mean, that's the level that many American families are living under. They balance their budgets. It's time for Washington to do it as well. So I know the people in Wyoming, and I've visited with a number through the week and many, in many communities last weekend, in Warland, in Casper, in Laramie, what they're saying is get the spending under control, do it in a reasonable manner. But for someone to come from the other side of the aisle and said, I think that the best thing in the world to do is to have a shutdown, and for another person to just say, I always use the word extreme, that is what the caucus instructed me to use this week, that doesn't solve the problem. That doesn't let us find a solution. And there is a solution on the table right now, and it is a solution that has been proposed and this Senate ought to be voting on tonight. For the President to say, I'm going to veto it, shows that the President is truly not engaged in this process. He has been silent too long, according to the New York Times. His budget uh, that he has proposed, the Economist, a world-renowned, respected publication, called his, his budget dishonest. That's not the kind of leadership we need. We need someone in the White House, fully engaged, taking an active role and making sure we get back onto a course that is responsible, that allows us as a country to live within our means as families. No, because we have to stop spending money we do not have. Stop spending money we don't have. That's the way for Washington to behave in a responsible way to make the difficult decisions that are necessary for the future of the country, to focus on the issues that affect families and they affect their needs. And for families that are trying to deal with kids and bills and a mortgage, they know what it means to have to live within their means. When we see policies coming out of this administration that are ones making the pain at the pump even worse as families are noticing they're paying $700 on average more for gasoline this year than they did last year. That's money that's not available for other bills or for a mortgage or to, or, to, or to help with their kids. Those are the issues they're facing. For people trying to pay for their own health insurance, realizing the increased cost of the insurance because of the Obama health care law that passed way over the objections of the American people, crammed down the throats of the American people by the other side of the aisle, 
the American people are saying, this is absolutely wrong. That's why I think we saw last November the election results that we, could, we did across the country. That's why we see people continuing to stand up and speak out across the country. That's why people continue to go to town hall meetings and share their views about the problems that are happening in this country. You know, it's, uh, it, it's just interesting, Mr. President. You know, I think of the great presidents through the history of this country, and we all have our favorites, and, and I think of Ronald Reagan. And, you know, he said, you can't be for big government and big spending and, be ta and big taxes and still be for the little guy. And, Mr. President, we have, on the other side of the aisle, people who are for big government, big spending, big taxes. They're not for the little guy. Thank you, Mr. President. Now you